Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Take your time now. It's okay. <laughs> Anyone else notice that big yellow ball in the sky? Yeah. <laughs> nice. It's been weeks, I've forgotten what it looks like, so I stared at it for a while, and suddenly it didn't really feel that great, but I'm sure the rest of you are enjoying it a lot more. <laughs> but just as sunny as all the people here today, so thank you for coming. Oh, oh. <laughs> it's the second Sunday after you've been here. Thank you for coming to worship. Oh, dear. Friends, as we gather to worship, we acknowledge that the land upon which our communities serve and worship is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe Nation, on land covered by Treaty Number 29, also known as the Huron Tract Purchase of 1827. We give thanks for the opportunity to live and serve on this land with all its peoples. We acknowledge where relations have gone awry, and we continue to apologize and live out that apology in listening and in action, both as a church and as individuals. And as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship, we take a moment to uplift that identity which binds us all together, the reason why we feel called to come and worship as a faith community, because we are siblings in Christ. So in that spirit, we light our Christ candle. <clears throat> We celebrate God in our midst as loving parent, devoted son, and imminent spirit, a relationship ever sure and ever new. Theoretically. <laughs> it's shining in our hearts, but what will shine <laughs> Candles of care, where we reflect on those on our hearts today, in our families, in our congregations, in our community, and around the world, who are especially on our hearts at this time. Friends, the peace of Christ be with you all. <laughs> Take a moment, give a wave, give a peace sign, however you want to greet one another. <laughs>
inviting God. You call us from coastlands and fields, from near and far, to be a community that puts love and justice for all first. In this time of worship, may your presence be made known in this community, being our strength when we are called to follow, being the stranger when we are called to invite, being the shepherd and lamb when we wrestle with faith. Be our everything, God, in whose Son, Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, so over at Bly this morning, I, for the time for the young and young at heart, I asked them, what's something that you can't technically do or play alone, but it's better to be done when it's done with others? And one little boy had the grip, he said, hide and seek. <laughs> <laughs> the hiding's good, it's the seeking. Good. <laughs> and they also said chess, and I thought, well, I could probably lose a game of chess to myself, so that's it. So I want to ask you, what are some things that, you know, you can do individually, and it's just fine, but it's just better when it's done as a community, as a group of people? Jigsaw puzzle. Jigsaw puzzle. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> I get frustrated enough doing that. I don't need <laughs> others there to witness it. Eating a meal. Eating a meal, yeah. Playing cards. Playing cards. Yeah. What? Dance. Dancing. Well, no. <laughs> yeah, we're all dancing together. That's what we got here. Watch out, no. Let's just. Singing. Traveling. Singing. What was that back there? Traveling. Traveling, yeah. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> All these different things, that it can be the small and significant things, it can be the daily rounds of life, it can be some of those really special moments that we want to share with others. The point is, quite often things just feel better when it's done in community. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. We're going to be focusing on community and about inviting to community, the invitation, the thing where we ask, where we tell others, to come and see. That's going to be our phrase for today. Come and see. And we hear that in our scripture readings for today. Our first scripture reading for today comes from the prophet Isaiah chapter 49. This is another one of those servant songs. We heard one of them last week. This is another one of the four. Where we hear about uh, the qualities of God's servant. And how uh, we're inspired to follow the servant. Or to be the example of the servant ourselves. And I'll do the same plug as last week, if this is something that interests you. We're doing our prophet study starting just week after next, so uh, keep an eye out for that. But for now, we hear from Isaiah chapter 49. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born, while I was in my, my mother's womb. He named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadows of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord and my reward with my God. And now the Lord says, the Lord who formed me in the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. Instead, I will give you as a light to all the nations, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the servant of rulers. Kings shall see and stand up, princes too, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord, who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. 
Our song for today is Psalm 40. This is a song of patience, waiting for God's presence, and praising all the different ways that God has inspired people near and far. So you can follow along on the screen here or in Voices United number 764. Glenda will play the refrain once, I'll sing it once, we'll sing it all together, and then go ahead with the reading. is the one who baptizes 
with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Jesus said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two disciples who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are now to be called Peter. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. We continue with our next hymn in Voices United, number 567. Will you come and follow me? Verses 1, 2, and 4. and deciding on where each pebble and shard of glass ought to go. 
and how these varied and tiny pieces work together in harmony to create a bigger picture. People often use the imagery of a mosaic to talk about the makeup of a community as well. But what happens if a community is feeling like they're not seeing the bigger picture? Or they feel like there's too few or too different of pieces to come together cohesively? Those are the same questions of community and identity that we find in our biblical narratives. The servant song from Isaiah comes from a point in time where the people are in exile, surrounded by an entirely different culture, exposed to different shapes and colors and images and ideas. The Israelites were having the greatest of difficulties figuring out what God's big picture was. They had a pretty neat and concise picture before. In the Holy Land, they had a temple, they had a way of living that ensured a strong bond between the tribes and a fairly uniform set of materials for God to work with. But now it seemed like everything in the kitchen sink was being thrown into the picture. It challenged the Israelites in terms of how they saw themselves and how they saw God. And then we have another take on the scene of, uh, by the Jordan River. In John's interpretation of the event, thank you, the author incorporates the baptism and calling of the first disciples all in the same passage. Yet for many, those fishermen brothers, those people on the shore, still wouldn't have been seen as important enough to be included in any of God's plans. They were pebbles not even worth trying to skip across the water, let alone be part of some divine master. John himself, even though he sounded like someone who knew the bigger picture, he was the one who could say, that's the Lamb, that's the Son of God. He himself was a pretty odd marvel, disheveled, dynamic, often confrontational. Many thought him too jagged and rough to be a part of God's pretty picture. All these different biblical pieces paint a similar picture to our current concerns around community, around the idea of being welcoming and inviting. As faith communities, we are called to be open to others, and we're called to take up our calls of discipleship in quite often very public ways. But our cultural conditioning makes this difficult, and I think for two main reasons. The first being that we're conditioned to fear the other. And we're conditioned by those who can profit off of division and hatred. Especially in an increasingly diverse society, we may be tempted to not want them to be a part of the makeup of our community. Whether we want to admit it or not, we far prefer our communities to be melting pots, rather than mosaics where each individual is recognized. And secondly, in our tendency to see faith as a pretty private thing, we find it hard to muster up the courage to actively invite others into our lives of faith. With church not being a cultural expectation these days, just having the door open isn't enough. It's about being open enough within our hearts and our faith to reach out to others, to actively say, come and see. Perhaps we may not feel confident enough about ourselves or God's grand picture to want others to get mixed into it. But in the face of these fears and these questions about our communities, God, the great artist and creator, continues to say to us, come and see. Our God, whose love and justice and creativity goes beyond even the greatest of the art masters, that God can put together with shards and pebbles and seemingly insignificant or strange people a mosaic of faith, a true picture of the kingdom come. In this entire epiphany season, we learn more about this transgressive and uplifting artist God, and we take a step back and see the great and wondrous image taking shape. Appreciating the love and artistry of God is to appreciate the sheer diversity we find in life. 
God is constantly expanding boundaries and horizons, inviting unexpected people to take part. We hear it in the passage from Isaiah. It isn't just for the people in exile whom God will renew and support. It's a salvation and love that is offered to all the nations, to the ends of the earth. The call that Isaiah speaks of is for everyone to love and serve and seek justice. The people of the coastlands and the far-off places are just as loved by God. For John the Baptist, Andrew, Simon Peter, and the others on the banks of the Jordan, they learned the valuable lesson that they were indeed worthy enough to be a part of God's great design, just as much as any other pebble or marble or shard of glass around them. They may have seemed eccentric or lacking luster, but they were invited and actively sought out by Jesus. It wasn't just a case of wandering in by accident, but rather a divine invitation to participate in something bigger than themselves, full of the shiniest and the dullest, the smallest and the largest, the smoothest and the roughest pieces. And perhaps they were so compelled by Jesus because Jesus himself wasn't the peace that everyone was expecting. A servant, a lamb, someone who would accept to be baptized. Not what people were expecting in a Messiah. Jesus would often go against the grain, but he would also prove himself to be the one who lived out the promise spoken of by Isaiah. The one to bind the whole world in love and service unto one another. And it all started with a simple phrase, come and see, come and see, come and see we are beckoned, to see the bigger picture in God, a picture of love and justice and grace, to see where God is leading us in the world, and to see the amazing diversity that God inspires in the world. It's that invitation, that hospitality and diverse community nurturing that is the hallmark of this and all the other call stories that we find in our faith narrative. So as a wider United Church, we are striving to be this hospitable, inviting community. To face this new era with artistry and inclusivity that God's Spirit inspires. As a church reckoning with its history of residential schools and lack of support for marginalized peoples, we are now trying to better live into the grand picture of God's diverse and loving kingdom. We're taking greater accountability as an institution, supporting our indigenous and other minority faith communities as they express themselves more authentically. And we encourage different ministries around the country that are trying to be within their local communities in a more radical and invitational way. But perhaps our greatest call today that God offers in this call story is for us to use our own voices to say in our own backyards, come and see. Since we're seemingly getting new neighbors by the day, we ought to celebrate the new pieces, the pebbles and shards that add just that little bit more color and texture that make the picture more vibrant. And more than ever, we're, we need to not just have open doors, but to be actively inviting as a faith community. For both those new in town and those who we haven't seen here in quite a while, think about how you can use your voice to say, come and see. See what God is doing and see what God is inspiring us to do. May we be active parts of God's mosaic, God's big picture of love and discipleship. Amen. As we take up God's invitation and God's presence with us, we are reminded that that presence is one that is compels us to be renewed as well as to be opened.
So in that spirit, I ask you to join with me in our prayer of confession and agreement. <clears throat> Loving God, we hear and take up your call, but often the life of discipleship makes us confront our barriers. The barriers built up around our hearts, afraid of being vulnerable and caring. The barriers around our communities, fearing the outsider and other. The barriers around our minds, doubting that true hope and love can exist. God, call us by name once more. With your voice and invitation, break down the barriers. For these and other transgressions, have mercy upon us and renew us. Friends, take comfort. As the psalmist proclaims, God puts a new song in our mouths and hears our cries for renewal and change. The love and compassion that God embodies in Christ Jesus is offered to us and to all, transforming us into a truly open and serving community of disciples. Thanks be to God. Amen. We continue with our next hymn found in more voices, number 145, Draw the Circle Wide. Concerns, 
you're encouraged to reach out to Reverend Kathy Barman. She's the one who will be covering for me. And we're very blessed that Sandra will be leading worship next Sunday. So be sure to uh, invite others to attend next week. Um, as well, coming up, we have our annual meeting that's happening on Sunday, February the 5th. Uh, thanks to all of those who have uh, submitted their reports for that. For those who still need to submit their reports, if you could please do that as soon as possible. We're really hoping to be able to send them to the printers this week. So, um, yeah, ASAP. <laughs> uh, and so as a reminder, the annual meeting on February the 5th happens after worship. So just plan on sticking around uh, after uh, that Sunday service. Uh, other things going on is our prophet study, which will be starting not this coming week, but the week afterwards. Uh, I'll be leading that on Zoom, so online. I'll be doing two sessions a week on Tuesday evenings or Thursday mornings. You pick the time that works best for you. Uh, we're going to be exploring mainly Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, but we'll also be exploring a little bit about what the wisdom from the prophets can what wisdom from the prophets can still speak to us today and the questions and challenges that we face. So I'm really looking forward to exploring those topics with all of you. If you do want to take part, just send out a quick email to me or leave a message on the phone or a note on the door uh, and I'll be sure to get uh, materials to you when I get back. Um, do we have a date for the next games? We do? The last Friday of this month. The last Friday of this month. They had such a good time. It looks to me as if we're going to be going every two weeks. Every two weeks. Okay, we so. 18 on Friday at the Euchre and Crokinole and Scrabble and that's the number one. Crick. 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 Yeah. <laughs> 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 yes, yeah, so this uh, Friday afternoon games thing is a really great opportunity for community. We have folks that aren't regular worshippers that were there, so that was great too. So I uh, plan on attending that the last Friday in January. And uh, yes, are there... I'm sorry? We have a stewards meeting. When is that? This Tuesday night. So this Tuesday, the 17th, stewards meeting at 7 o'clock here at the church. All right. Any other announcements or celebrations to be shared? Any birthdays that recently happened? <laughs> Let's rip up them. Set adrift, hoping to find a place to land somewhere safe so you can rebuild your life. There's this huge misconception that refugees choose to be refugees, says Chris Ann Alvarez, refugee support at the United Church of Canada. She says it's not a choice, it's something that they're forced into. It's a reality that's faced by millions of refugees, and it's a reality that's becoming more and more prominent. More people are displaced today than ever before. Upwards of 100 million, says the United Nations Refugee Agency. That's the equivalent of three Canadas. There are many causes for this. Human conflict, climate change, human rights violations, and more. But we are called to help. Your gifts provide food, water, sanitation, and social support to people forced to flee their homes. Mission and Service creates educational and confidence-building programs within refugee camps. Mission and Service also helps refugees find new homes. Alvarez explains congregations form sponsorship groups together to sponsor the refugee. And what Mission and Service allows is for them to sponsor through their own congregation. 
She tells one story of a sponsor who renovated their basement after it flooded and immediately planned to sponsor a refugee in that new space. The refugee stayed with the sponsors for many years and they became an adopted family to one another. Alvarez recalls, the sponsor told me we have no kids, so this was an unexpected blessing. That's just one example of someone opening their home in their home and in their heart and allowing themselves to be transformed. When we help protect one refugee from persecution, death, or years in a refugee camp, we save the world for that one person, and just maybe for ourselves too. Thank you for your support of Mission and Service. We are called to support our neighbors near and far in all that we do. That includes which are with our offering, which will now be received.
May their journeys be safe and may they reach destinations where hospitality is offered. May all people who claim to worship you hear your frequent call to care for the stranger and foreigner. And may we all work toward the day of your favor when hostility will finally cease. In all of this, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now in a moment, we gather up in prayer those who are on our hearts for particular reasons today, either spoken aloud or in silent prayer, knowing that all is heard by you, loving God. so lovingly taught by your risen son, singing them as found together in Voices United, number 960.
siblings in Christ, we are being beckoned into the world. Jesus says, come and see, and we shall see a great diversity of people with whom we can be a community. In our personal lives, in our community of faith, may we be open and caring, learning and sharing. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. We'll join together in our closing response, which we'll sing twice through. Thank you. 